This is another CTF 900 Pioneer cassette from 1978 or 1979. What we're going to do is I'll go ahead and do what I normally do with these as I start usually with the face cover off. I'll take you through a tour of the things that had to be done to this deck, talk to you a little bit about uh, what, uh, what I have and have not done, and uh, then uh, we'll have some demonstrations. I'll do some recording on various uh, test tapes. We'll, we'll use a, uh, just a standard position tape. We'll use a ferrochrome tape, and uh, we'll finish off with a uh, chromium dioxide setting high bias tape. Okay, so now that Google has, uh, or not Google, but uh, YouTube has probably identified the music and has copyright flagged this, I'll go ahead and get started. So, as is typical with these decks, they almost always come with, well, they always come with problems on the mechanical side. Uh, everything from this uh, idler tire to a complete set of belts that have to be replaced. So the whole mechanism has to be taken apart, cleaned up. Uh, anything that's broken has to be fixed. Any, uh, any belts that are in there, they're all replaced. And then I do some minor regreasing with uh, with white grease. Uh, usually on these decks, I, I replace the pinch rollers. Now these pinch rollers, uh, when I uh, replace them, they are $50. They cost me $50 uh, a pinch roller. I, I use Terry's um, to, uh, to return pinch rollers and he charges me 50 bucks each. Uh, when I took this apart, I took the uh, the pinch roller arms off, and I was ready to replace them. And I and I noticed just with uh, a quick run with some rubber restore that they cleaned up really nicely. And what I realized was they had been replaced. So sometime uh, during this deck's life, uh, the pinch rollers had been replaced, and. It, and it occurred to me as I did that, that the two main belts also look pretty good. Um, and then except for there, there's, there happens to be a rewind belt that's right back here that hadn't been replaced, but that requires that when you take this apart, there's another piece you've got to take apart here and it, it can get uh, pretty messy. So, um, Somebody had done some partial work on it at, at a point in time, but these, these pinch rollers clean up really nicely. So these are not original. They had been replaced at some point in time. Uh, a couple of other things, of course, you know, I always take the lens cover off and clean it. This lens cover had, uh, had cracked. This is typical because the way that the deck is built is uh, the cassette mechanism. Uh, I'm not done with it when I put the faceplate on. I'll have the two additional screws and two on the bottom. Uh, but this actually adds to the integrity of, of the case. So if it's not really tight, then uh, as the case is it, in shipping, sometimes that they'll get cracked. But they, it, it's in good uh, shape. Everything behind it is in good shape. Now I'll go ahead and go off of the tripod and, and walk around through the unit in just a minute. But whenever I take the pinch roller uh, arms off, then I have to put them back on and I have to recalibrate this particular arm. That's why it's got uh, paint on it. And of course you'll notice that there's red here because what I do is an azimuth uh, correction on all of these decks. Um, when uh, before I, I let it uh, go, so let's uh, let's see. Uh, let, let me go ahead and look at the label that I've got on this, and we'll just run through what was done. On the label, I've got oh, I had to replace the power cord. Somebody had cut the power cord, and it was really short and had a had a, um, a temporary um, uh, plug on it. 
got rid of that, put a new cord on it proper. Uh, of course, I had to, something was really odd with record. Sometimes it would record, sometimes it wouldn't. And normally it's a switch that's bad. Turned out it wasn't the switch. It turned out that it was actually uh, the, there's a, there's a wire that goes to a, a harness back here. And in the harness, one of, uh, one of the contacts was broken. So I took, took that out and replaced it. It's working fairly well now. We're going to go. Uh, we're going to go off of uh, tripod, and I'm going to take you on a tour of the inside. On the inside of the deck, you'll notice all all the decks always uh, get their rewind motor rebuilt. I I rebuild these because they endure a lot of stress, a lot of work. They're doing a lot of work. They operate at two different voltages. Um, high uh, high voltage of 13 volts when it's uh, rewinding and I think it's nine when it's in in a normal take up mode but they always have a really dirty armature and after you know 30 40 years of use they're they're in pretty bad shape I don't take apart the drive motor primarily because uh, it's nearly impossible to take it uh, apart there's there's a lot of work to it I've never had one go bad. I've had them that I've had to adjust, but other than that, they've usually been uh, just fine. So when we talk about recapping, I've now gotten into the habit of just recapping the entire uh, power board. That's the power board that you're looking at right there. All new capacitors, all new capacitors, uh, electrolytic capacitors that is, on this board. And I'm starting to do that now primarily because even though the old capacitors, and I'll, I'll swing around and let you see, there's the bunch of old capacitors. Even though every one of those tested within 20% tolerance, um, what I don't want to have happen is to sell this and have a capacitor go bad. And it could take out other things. I've had problems on the power board that have uh, completely blown out the IC on the on the uh, FL display so and to fix the FL display is a bear because you've got to take that board apart and that's something I'm not going to do unless I have to the other uh, recapping was done on the control board now this is the control board and the control board uh, manages all your logic with the buttons right so your fast forward rewind and and the sensing of what happens when you get to the end of the tape and all that sort of thing so this board did get fully recapped now I did have someone who bought a unit took it to have it serviced and said that the service professional said something was getting really really hot in the in the uh, in in the cassette deck this this resistor, this is a seven watt, seven, seven watt, seven and a half ohm uh, resistor. This gets very hot on the right side or the side um, that you're, yeah, that would be to the right that you're looking at. Uh, that's actually the hotter side and the cooler side is on the left hand side. That gets hot because what it's doing is it's controlling and managing the solenoids like that solenoid right there so um and those solenoids are pretty hefty that's a big coil uh the solenoids pop on at 13 volts and i think they drop to something around nine or maybe six volts just enough to keep keep it uh engaged but that's that's the only thing that gets really hot it doesn't uh, it's supposed to that's not an issue uh, it's not something you have to replace. Um, works just fine. Now, the motherboard. The motherboard is this section over here. Now, the motherboard, I did not recap in this unit. And I'll tell you why. I know that you watch a thousand videos out there with everybody who says recap, recap, recap. And they're right when it comes to something that if a capacitor goes, it could take out the rest of the unit, especially the power board. Or a capacitor on this board, that will have a direct effect on the operation of the unit. I scoped this, I checked it. Um, 
it just doesn't, it sounds so darn good. There is no reason for me to mess with it. And even the pots, you'll notice I always mark my pots. The only pots that needed even minor changing were the record pots, which I changed very minutely. Uh, but the unit in it, in and of itself is almost like a brand unit, brand new unit. Even the Dolby um, switch, I, I take these apart all the time and I, I run a uh, cotton swab up through it and when I pull it out, it's almost black, always. This was nothing. There was nothing in there. I mean, it, it didn't make noise before I did it. It didn't give any static. It, it was in great shape. Could be that this unit was just very rarely used. I don't know. But... This being the motherboard, I did not recap it. And of course, the uh, FL display board, that's this board back here, which is just a bear to take apart, was not recapped. Now, I have I have had units where I've recapped everything, including, including the two riser boards, which are your um, headphone amplifier and your um, mic amp. It, uh, and I've done them all. This one doesn't need it. Um, if that bothers you, uh, don't buy the unit, right? Um, but quite frankly, you're going to hear it in a minute. It just sounds like gangbusters. So I'm going to go ahead and put the faceplate back on and uh, uh, go ahead and put the top back on. And then we'll, we'll have a listen to some different recordings. Oh, one other thing. The top that came with this, well, I'll put it on and show you, was in such good condition I didn't do any kind of painting of the top. Sometimes I'll do that and I have to do that to make it, uh, to make it saleable. This one didn't need it. Oh yeah. Yeah. One last thing. I always do this. Let me just make sure that you folks can see the, um, if you can see the serial number here, so that you know, it's the unit that we're talking about. Okay, so I'm going to go go ahead and put this thing back together, and uh, and we'll we'll do do some testing with tapes. Okay, here is the formal introduction to the Pioneer CTF 900 stereo cassette tape deck that was built in the late 1970s. I think this uh, the motor on this had a 1978 timestamp on it. This one is particularly nice. It comes with this black bezel. I have seen that on some decks. I don't think I've ever had one. Uh, very nice looking bezel in, and I was able to take it out and polish it up and get it nice and clean along with polishing all of the buttons. You'll notice they're all nice and shiny and clean. Everything looks nice. Now on the, on the faceplate, I'll point out some some blemishes. You have a scratch here. I can't do anything about that. It's brushed aluminum. There are a couple of dings. There's a dent here, a little bit of something here, a dent over here. Um, there's a little bit of blemish on this side. Um, uh, and I think that's pretty much it. The corners are in pretty good condition. Sometimes they're really beat up. Not in, uh, not in this case. Uh, the, the front, there's a little bit of a uh, ding there, a little bit here. And I point these things out um, just so that uh, folks understand. You know, remember, you're getting something that's been probably pulled out of a dumpster. So God only knows what happened to it when, when that uh, got dropped in. Um, this, uh, the, the dust protector snaps nicely into place. Uh, and now we're going to go ahead and, and do a, a demonstration and later I'll take you through the, uh, around the deck as well. So you'll notice everything starts up just fine. Uh, we're going to play some music just to, uh, do some quick, uh, testing. This is coming from the YouTube library, so I won't get a copyright ding. I'll go ahead and put a tape in and we'll see how things go. And we're going to start with just a standard uh, tape. Uh, 
and we're going to start just somewhere in the middle of this tape. We're going to zero out our counter and we're going to start. Now, before we start, let me explain what we're going to be looking at here. To record on these decks, you have a tape and a source. Well, you were just listening to source, which is just passing through whatever's coming into the line in. When you have it on tape, this is a three head deck. So what's happening is it's actually recording onto the tape with the left, which is the record, and it's playing it back on the right uh, side of that head. Um, very popular in the uh, late 80s and all the way through the 90s where you would have a three head deck. You could actually listen to what was being recorded. Um, we have a bias fine adjustment. This works only when you record. Since this is a standard tape, you'll notice that neither of these two lights are lit up. If this were uh, a ferrochrome tape, and I'll put one in, in a minute, then we would have to manually tell the unit, hey, it's a ferrochrome tape. Uh, it will sense that it's a uh, CRO2 tape on its own. Uh, we have Dolby, which is only Dolby B. That's all that was available at the, at the time these decks were made. This volume control is a dual control, uh, left and right, that uh, work together, but you can hold one and you can, you can change uh, the volume either way. Same thing with the input. That's a dual control. You have old style headphones, a quarter inch jack, and of course you've got a quarter inch uh, left and right mic. When you use the mic, you change this to input and it will you it'll switch from line to mic. Now on the display, you've got counter reset. You have a timer start. And timer start is used uh, when years ago you would have a timer. There was a timer that came along with these that you could buy separately that would just power up the unit. And as soon as the unit was powered up, uh, if it was on play, it would just start playing automatically. If it was on record, it would start recording automatically. And so I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate that now by turning on the deck, record in. Notice the record light, and it's starting to record there. Okay? So since we've gone ahead and started recording, we'll go ahead and let you see how this works. Notice when you change the output, it looks like what's being recorded is going down. It's not the case. This is controlling what, we, what we're seeing here as output. But the view meter is also serving as the input meter for the source material coming in. The bias fine adjustment will work only on recording. Now listen to this as I change it. Now, if you noticed, further left, the more emphasis on highs, the further right, it's almost like a treble, only backwards. It's not, uh, that's not what it is, but it acts like that in this demonstration. Keeping it in the middle is about right. This is affecting how the bias is, uh, is adjusted during the recording of the tape. It will act differently depending on the tape. So this is a, I don't know, this is a Max L. It might not act like that with a, it may not act like that with a TDK, for example. So it's, it, the design is to uh, match your tape to your ears, make it sound the way you want it to sound. Okay, so we just listened to it record something. Uh, it automatically started recording when we, when we turned on because we had the timer start set. I'm going to turn that off because I don't want it to do anything when I turn the deck on. Now, you also have these, this memory, play, counter, and, and off. If you set this to counter, remember we started at zero, what will happen is this will start playing 
when I rewind and that gets to zero. That was some prior data that was on the tape. The whole point of this is to allow you to start at a certain position um, and play. You could also just say to have it stop and it just stops, right? So there are a couple of things that you can use that for. And one thing that I particularly like to do is put it on end. And when I put it on end, it will rewind the tape after it's done playing, it'll finish the tape out, it will rewind and play that tape. So it'll play that one side over and over and over again. It is not an auto reverse deck, but with this depressed, it will play the tape over. And, and of course, with that set to end, it will rewind from any point in the tape and start playing once it's rewound. That's kind of nice you'll find on later decks that they seem to have lost that feature and I don't really understand why. Okay, so uh, we'll do a quick playback of this so that you can hear uh, what it sounds like and listen for when I was changing the bias fine. That's when I turned it far left. And when I turned it far right. Far left again. Far right. And then I'll end with it in the middle. Now we're going to try another tape type. We'll use a ferrochrome tape. And if you're saying, well, but you know, ferrochrome tapes really aren't, aren't available anymore. You're right there. They stopped making them in 1985. Sony, Sony stopped making the ferrochrome tape in 1985. Oh, by the way, notice that's set at end and it starts to play. All right. So this kind of tape, even though, yeah, you can still get them on eBay. Uh, you can get them used, you can get them, still get them new, um, in new in terms of new old stock. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, set the auto to ferrochrome. And the way it knows that, by the way, is if you look at the top, this is like the old style tape. There's no little indentation um, to tell it that it's a chrome tape. See a chrome tape? Chrome tape has an extra slot over here, and that tells the automatic sensing that it's a chrome tape. But the old old style uh, ferrochrome didn't have that, so you had to on these decks you had to tell it. And well, I've got a ferrochrome tape, so ferrochrome tape. Let's give this one a, a try and and listen to see what this sounds like. And I'll choose probably something a little different. Let's get this uh, let's get this going. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get that started. I'm going to, let me see, I'll play that World Sunrise again, maybe something else. Now remember, you're hearing it as it's recording on the tape. This is what's being recorded at the moment. 
or what's just been recorded on the tape. See how that has a completely different effect on this kind of tape than it did the other tape? Having it at zero pretty much sounds the best, or maybe really warm to the right. But far left detenuates it. So let's listen to that and see how that sounds on playback. Now notice I have left Dolby in. I'll take Dolby out here so that you can see or hear the difference. Uh, but that that will make a very slight difference with highs. Notice the difference with that bias adjust. Well, that was all, all the way left, it detenuated. So we brought it back middle, and I would argue this tape could probably have it at a plus three or a plus four to make it sound even better. So that's taking Dolby out, so you can hear that Dolby is uh, is kicking in. Now we're going to go ahead and put the equivalent of a chromium dioxide tape in. Now these tapes are plentiful on eBay, um, but I will tell you, your standard, your standard tapes sound pretty darn good in these decks. So we're going to do the same thing with it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, record a selection. We'll keep using the same selection that we've got here and uh, see how that sounds with a chrome tape. Now the bias fine is going to act differently and we'll see how that works in just a moment. So let's go ahead and put the pause on, get ourselves ready to go and start the music now after the leader. won't because I left the... No, that's right. So I had forgotten to tell you that when I put that tape in, did you see the chrome set? Even though I had that pushed in, the CRO2 was automatically selected. So we're going to start this over again. Uh, and another, uh, one of the reasons is I forget that some of these tapes, these test tapes, have been used so many times that the beginning part of the, the tape is 
it's not in as good a condition, maybe, as somewhere in the middle. So we'll go ahead and zero and start that um, selection over again. You'll notice I've changed this, and I'll change it when we have a hi-hat introduced, but not a lot of difference on the chrome tape. It goes a little brighter when we move it to the left. And now I've moved it to the right, it makes it a little duller, and then I returned it to the middle. So that takes you through three different tape types. Now why don't why don't I test a metal? Well, these decks were not made to record on metal tapes. It was the 950 that introduced the capability to record onto a metal tape. And the difference between the two, outside of a metal biasing circuit, includes a different kind of record head. So this record head will not erase or uh, manage a metal tape properly. And to finish it up with a real quick recording of something that's uh, got a little more fidelity to it.
that sounds really good. And then finally, of course, what does a store-bought or a production tape sound like? Pretty darn good. That's with Dolby. All right, so I'm going to go off tripod and show you around the deck before I publish this video. Thanks for watching. Leave any uh, questions in the comment area and I'll try to answer them on the YouTube channel. Uh, on the eBay listing, post any questions before you buy the unit. I can't emphasize this enough. Ask the questions first. This cannot be returned. This is a for sale as is. I've shown you everything about this unit, dings included. Uh, I guarantee it not to be DOA. So if you take it out of the box and it doesn't work, that's one thing. But uh, I record the serial number. I record where everything is on the inside of the deck uh, I also have other pictures so that, and this has happened, I've received something back that someone said was damaged and they had swapped out parts. Um, eBay took care of that one for me. So I make sure I'm very well documented uh, to protect myself. Uh, but uh, this unit should, uh, I can't certainly can't guarantee it for life. What I can say is that it will work as it is in these videos, it will work that way when you get it. My expectation is because of the work that I've done on it, I've breathed some life into it. But at least if you do run into a problem sometime down the road, it is in better shape than it was before for somebody to service locally. All right, so I'm going to go off tripod and just kind of take you around the unit so you can see what it looks like. Okay, here's the sort of handheld overview. You can see some of the blemishes uh, on the unit. It's not too bad on the top. Um, there is sort of a scratch here. I can't get that scratch out. But the top overall is in pretty good shape. Sides are in pretty good shape. The back of the view of the unit is, uh, is in pretty good shape. Um, and I do put two stickers, one's a QA checklist, and then the other one is what was done to the what I did to the unit or what I observed. Uh, and they both are removable. Uh, and there's your um, Serial number ending, I think, I don't have my glasses on, but it looks like it's 876 or 676. Um, 876. So you uh, know what unit you're getting. All right, so this is going up on eBay. Thank you.